Hello, South Africa, and welcome back to Friday's uh, version of CoronaCast, your twice-weekly information show, keeping U.S. citizens up to date and informed uh, with the latest issues relating to coronavirus and its impact on our citizens. Well, today is day 57 of the uh, lockdown period. It's day 22 of level four of this lockdown period. As South Africans wait in anticipation uh, for an alleviation of the lockdown, which is now uh, costing our economy around about 13 billion rand a day, and which is now really starting to bite into our communities. And uh, we start off with some good news on today's show, and that is that this week, the Human Rights Commission ruled in the Democratic Alliance's favor in our challenge against the Department of Social Development's draconian, unfair, and backwards uh, ruling that only the department would be able to distribute food uh, and that they would insist that NGOs and uh, service providers to, that have been feeding hungry people across South Africa would need to get permission from the Social Development Department to do so. Well, the Human Rights Commission has found otherwise and uh, said that it is a violation of uh, the human rights of South Africans. And so I want to thank all of those NGOs, those CBOs, those church organizations, those civil society bodies who have been actively continuing to feed hungry South Africans during this time. There's no greater show of compassion and unity than coming together as South Africans to help those less fortunate uh, than ourselves, uh, particularly those families who have lost their income streams and are fast losing the ability to be able to provide for their families as this hard lockdown bites down on the economy. Well, today's show uh, is another action-packed show and we're obviously trying to keep on the cutting edge of the questions that are on your mind. So remember to keep those questions uh, coming in and suggestions of the type of topics uh, that you would like us to be traversing. But this week we saw that the Minister of Basic Education, Angie Mochecha, announced that schools will be reopening on the 1st of June. Now, it was a really confused and convoluted uh, press conference, which has left many, many people uh, still unsure about what is the case. But it's also been a very controversial topic. Our children are our greatest assets and resources and our greatest care and concern. And so parents around the country are right to be concerned and worried about what the impact of the school opening is going to be. So I've got uh, our uh, Shadow Minister of Higher Education, Science and Technology, Belinda Bazzoli, uh, who's a member of parliament, but who's also headed up our Shadow Cabinet work stream uh, on the education space in South Africa with DA public representatives uh, around the various provinces and in the National Assembly coming together to put forward our position paper. So she'll be taking your questions and any concerns that you may have and addressing some of the issues related to the very controversial topic of schools reopening. And then to give us an update on our legal cases, a lot of people have been writing in and saying, please keep us updated about your legal challenges uh, against the unfair regulations and how you're clawing back uh, South Africa's civil liberties and the rights of ordinary citizens. Uh, I've got in studio our in-house DA counsel and legal advisor and uh, uh, from Minde Shapiro and Smith here in Cape Town, uh, Elzan Yonka, who's going to be taking us uh, through uh, those various cases. And we're going to have a little bit of a chat about the impact of COVID-19 on the administration of justice in South Africa. So welcome both Belinda and Elzan. Uh, Elzan in studio and Belinda's joining us uh, via computer link up because we've got to practice the social distancing that's required. Uh, but great to have both of you ladies uh, with me here today. And we're going to start with you, Belinda, if I may, because I know that already we've got lots and lots of, um, of, of questions coming through around, um, around education. I'm going to start off. There's been a lot of uh, brouhaha on Twitter today around uh, the story emanating from France about uh, schools there. Do you want to just uh, take me through your, your views and thoughts on that uh, to start off with? Hi, it's John. Thanks, Thanks for having me on your program. Um, what's happening in Europe is that most European countries have now opened schools, but people on Twitter who are specializing in anxiety about this have, have been telling us that 
All the schools have again closed in France because there have been outbreaks in them uh, of the COVID virus. Now, this is actually not true. France has 60,000 schools, and they've closed seven of them because there has been a small virus outbreak in those schools. Now, that is exactly the right thing to do. That is how we're going to have to live with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to monitor it, and we're going to have to take action mm -hmm. when it pops up. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing to worry about in the French uh, case. It seems to me to be small. It seems to me to be consistent with what we know, how things are going to develop. And they seem to have acted exactly as we would act once our schools are open. Sure. Well, Belinda, you've been heading the work stream uh, under our shadow cabinet that's been meeting every two days. And you guys have been applying your mind to the whole question around education, why it's important to save the academic year. There's a lot of matric students sitting at home worried about uh, what the future holds. Do you want to just take us through what your views and, and thoughts are and, and the, and the uh, position that the work stream uh, has arrived at? Well, look, the first thing to say is that that's not, it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. We absolutely acknowledge that opening of schools is a controversial and a difficult matter. People care about their children and they don't want them put in danger. And we've given a lot of thought to that. And we realize that there are a lot of concerns about um, your child getting infected, um, about whether the school is ready for your child to go to, how vulnerable the teachers are, and what will be done to protect the whole situation. We've looked at all of those factors and we've decided that actually you can open the schools without impinging too much on those worries. First of all, we've, we've looked carefully into the literature, and what we found is that children are very much less vulnerable to the virus than are adults. And I'm talking about by an order of magnitude less vulnerable. So we believe that that factor of the child getting infected is not as significant as we might have thought. And once adults start going back to work, they too are vulnerable and we are sending them back to work. And so we think with children being less vulnerable, it's okay to send them into schools. As for schools not being ready, we will not support the opening of schools unless they are ready. And we have our criteria, um, which I can talk about later, uh, of readiness. And then the third thing that worries people is um, the teachers. How vulnerable are the teachers? Well, actually, teachers do worry about their vulnerability and have expressed concern about it. And we, we say that, that um, teachers should go back if they don't have comorbidities or underlying conditions that prevent that, and that they should be particularly well screened, checked, and um, undertake social distancing. And the etiquette that's required in, in uh, the COVID virus and we think that they will probably be as okay as any other adults. Belinda, why is it so important to save the academic year? You know, there's a school of thought that says, why don't we just write off the year, uh, let everyone start again from where they were at, uh, at, at next year, in January next year, uh, or wait until the virus is gone uh, before we recommence. Why is it so important that we do what we can to save the academic year? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's very important because... First of all, you have kids f finishing their school. You have grade sevens who are at the end of their primary school teaching and are getting ready to go into high school. They need to finish that grade seven so they can go in high school. You don't want them to be stuck in grade seven. Another cohort of grade sevens arriving and having, a double, having to double up grade seven for a year, that, that's not acceptable. We want those kids to move up. And then even more importantly, you have the matrix who need to move out of school. They need to get the matric qualification. The colleges need them to come into, into their colleges. The universities need a first year or they will run into serious trouble. So finishing those two years we think is very important. And that's why we've supported uh, the minister in her decision to send those two, stand, those two grades back first. Mm -hmm. But there's another reason why it's important to finish the academic year and get schooling go, going as fast as you can. And that is that the literature shows that disadvantaged children suffer much more from a, a delay in schooling 
than um, advantaged children. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in the case of a disadvantaged home, first of all, parents are not as able to keep their children up to date using online learning and homeschooling. And secondly, the pressure on the, on, on the disadvantaged home for young people to go out and work is so huge that once they start missing months and months of school, they probably will never go back and they won't finish their year and they won't matriculate. And that is something that really concerns us. We don't want our children, our disadvantaged mm. gap to be even wider than it already is. Yeah. Melinda, there's a question here from Dumasani Twala who's written and say, is it going to be possible to screen and test all learners and teachers that are scheduled to resume classes? Uh, so is, is screening and testing a, a part of the, of the plan to go back? The plan is screening, but not testing. You screen in order to decide whether someone needs to be tested. So you will be screened. All pupils will be screened. Um, teachers will do the screening. And um, any, any learner that is found with a high temperature will be sent off for testing. Mm. So, yes, those are an integral part mm. of the package. And then uh, schools in hotspot areas. I mean, uh, so it is likely that some schools will open but others will remain closed uh, in, in, for the time being. And, and that's, that's part, of the, part of the management, I would imagine. Yes, we have to realise that managing COVID is going to be a long-term thing. It's going to go on for two years. And all these kinds of ad hoc local decisions are going to have to be made all the way along. So one of those would be if there's a hot spot, maybe hold back on the opening of those schools. Or if there is an outbreak in a school, close the school. That is not necessarily a failure of the opening of schools. It's a way of managing the COVID virus in as much of a normal situation as we can get it. Yeah. Um, Pat Van Zell sent a question a little bit earlier asking, how will the spacing of children in classrooms and break times work? Now, we know a lot of schools, particularly disadvantaged schools and uh, in poorer areas, uh, have a problem already with overcrowding in classrooms. How, how do we envisage this being managed over this period? Well, I take the Western Cape as an example because that's run by the DA and we very close to our own plan. I'm very close to our own plans for, for managing things. So what's happening there is when the matrix and the grade sevens go back, the school will be only a quarter full. It will be half empty. So there's plenty of room there for classes to be divided up or staggered or held in halls or all sorts of possible variations that you can have um, in, in the way you manage a school. Moving the desks far apart and having fewer desks, all of that sort of thing will be possible. The problem will arise when all the children are back. So once, you know, after the grade sevens and twelves, we'll have the grade sixes and elevens and grade fives and tens, etc., all the way down. And once the school is full again, we are going to have to turn to staggering of classes. So some, some learners will start early in the day and others will start later, holding classes in halls rather than in classrooms and um, a whole variety of other means which mm. have come pouring in, recommendations have come mm. pouring into the Western mm. Cape Department of Education as to how it could be done. Yeah. So we're working on that as, a spe as mm. we speak. But it must be enforced. There must be social distancing. Mm. You can't relent on that. Yeah. Now, there's some popular uh, opinion that what we should just do is give everybody a tablet and say you can get your classes through that. Do you want to just take us through some of the realities about why in the South African situation uh, that's just simply not uh, possible? You mean give them a ta oh, that kind uh, of a, a, okay. a, give them an iPad or a um, or a uh, or yeah. a device where they'll be able to to get their stuff online. Yeah, well, it'd be nice if you could learn through a pill, but anyway. <laughs> um, so give them all some sort of computing facility, and they will be able to learn through that. This is not going to really work, yeah. and we're even finding that in universities. Um, that to give you an example of univer twenty six universities. Only eight have managed to go online um, during this period. The other 18 are struggling with access to, um, to data, people living in areas where they don't even have proper um, uh, uh, wireless uh, access, and um, a whole lot of a host of other problems which have meant that people can't go online. So it's not going to happen 
across our broad community. So again, this is another reason why sending people back to school advantages the disadvantaged. It, it gives mm. them back some of the advantage of schooling mm. rather than sitting being further disadvantaged. Yeah. Um, what will happen to parents who are teachers who have small children at home? Uh, will domestic workers and, uh, and the like and child minders be allowed to go back in level three? Domestic workers and child minders are already allowed to go back mm. if they are looking after children. Um, so that, that, there's absolutely no problem with that. Mm. If they're looking after children or the el elderly, there can be domestic help in the home. Yeah. Belinda, let's talk about ECD because I've got a call, uh, a, a, a notice here from one of the uh, from the uh, viewers, Lance McQuillan, who makes a point that ECDs are much smaller and ready to open as safely as possible. Uh, they get zero government help and they've got um, got um, procedures in place. What what is the view on ECD? I agree. I agree with, with Lance. Mm. ECD should be allowed to open uh, if they can prove that they have all the, the various provisions in place. But the minister so far hasn't made any kind of pronouncement on it. So we're in a bit mm. of a limbo in, in that regard. Mm. She did say in her speech that um, she was looking at ECD seriously. Uh, she shares the oversight of them with the Department of Social Development. So mm. maybe there's some maneuvering to be done there between departments. Mm. Um, so we can only pressure her to hurry mm. up with a decision. And then obviously the big question is break time. Obviously, how is that going to work? You know, children uh, during break time, generally a lot more interaction. Uh, would you see that it was also being staggered during the day, like you've suggested with different start times? Yes, that, that would be a good idea. I think what the Western Cape is doing is it's going to rely on schools to come up with imaginative break programs for the children that do not force them together into groups. I mean, you could have the playing of certain games, um, you know, which, which keep social distancing and, um, uh, yeah. as you say, staggered breaks, various other, other options. Yeah. But uh, that's still yeah. to be worked out. And Belinda, what about parents who choose not to send their children back to school this time who, are, who remain nervous? I mean, uh, that, that is, a, I imagine, a personal choice. I suppose it would also be ill-advised at this time to send children who have comorbidities uh, into the system at, at this particular stage. Absolutely. I mean, nobody should be forced to send their child to school. And, and, and um, we completely understand the, the, the anxieties of parents. And, of course, with comorbidities, absolutely. Mm. So um, what the government has done, which we do support, is that it said... Um, P parents who refuse to send their children to school yet because they are worried about the virus will have to co will have to homeschool them. They, the school will help with that. Um, uh, they have to register and they have to apply for homeschooling. And I suppose they have to, in a way, show that they can do home homeschooling, which is not necessarily the case with all parents. Unfortunately, those who want to keep their children at home and who can't do homeschooling are going to have to ask their, if their child can repeat the year mm. um, because you cannot have a child pretending that it's done a year's work or six mm. months' work as it will be mm. and not having actually done it. Yeah. So there are two options there. Yeah. And so what would we recommend the protocol should uh, a case of COVID, for instance, be found positive in a school environment? Would we advocate the closing then of that school or just that class? How would it, how would it work? It's a question through from Jonathan Fisher. I'm not sure how many cases would warrant the closing of a school. When it's, when it's come to a hospital, they've actually had more than one case before they've closed the school, uh, the hospital. So, but I, I have to say, I'm not actually sure of the protocol there. Um, indefinitely, closing will have to happen at some point. Mm. But whether one case would be sufficient to warrant closing, I don't know. It could be depending on where the medical staff think that that uh, infection has come from. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, again, something yeah. I'm not very, very <coughs> up on. Now, there seems to have been a difference of opinion this week from the minister's side. And I must say, I found her briefing very confusing. Uh, and the teacher unions. And there, I think it was a cartoon in one of the papers today 
which showed them on two different horses driving in two different directions. What is the tension that's developed there around the, from the teacher union side? What is the argument that they're making? The teacher union started off by saying we will not support any opening of schools yet. And they really, you know, put their collective foot down and said absolutely no. However, the minister seems to have done wonders in persuading them to more or less go along with it. So we found um, provinces moving from absolutely no to let's make sure that the provisions are in place. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, unions saying, well, we don't think the provisions are in place, so we're going to block the opening. We've seen this in the Northern Cape. Mm -hmm. um, that happened this morning. Um, my view of that is that they probably need to wait a little bit because the provisions haven't yet been sent to the schools. They are all waiting in warehouses um, near the schools to be waiting to be delivered to the schools. So teachers that have great anxiety about opening, and again, I do understand that, do need to wait a little bit for that school to actually get the provisions that it needs, all the masks, uh, all the other PPE that it needs, mm -hmm. and then assess whether or not the schools are ready. But to simply say that a school isn't ready, mm -hmm. how much how much readiness does it really need? It needs the PPE, so wait for that. It needs to reorganise the classrooms. That seems to me once it once it's been decided how to do it, that's pretty straightforward. You can do it in a day or two, um, and it needs to educate the teachers as to how they're going to train the, the students, the, the learners, in the etiquette, the social distancing and the hygiene that's needed. We still have 10 days before the schools are due to open, and I think all of those things can be achieved within 10 days. Mm. So I would urge the unions not to block this, but rather to cooperate and try and get to the point where mm. they can actually open up the schools. If a school is not ready... We think it shouldn't open if it really seriously is not ready. It shouldn't open. Um, and we're, we're quite adamant about that. Um, I don't think the minister should charge around forcing schools to open when they aren't ready. Mm. And then just to talk about the curriculum a little bit, we had a call uh, through from Cheryl Hall, husband. Uh, do you think the curriculum is going to be adjusted, the holiday periods adjusted to make up for the lost time? Yes, from what I understand, the curriculum has been adjusted already. Um, the idea is as follows. If you're not in matric, um, what you have to do as a, as a learner is you have to finish the essential components of your year. And they've tried to remove a lot of stuff from the syllabus that um, they don't regard as absolutely core and essential for you to advance to the next year. You can always catch up on it in the next year, but it's, it, it, it will allow you to advance. Mm. As far as matrix are concerned, they will have to do the full curriculum. There's no cutting, no reducing, nothing. They will have to do the full curriculum and write the full exam, which means schools will be under an obligation to provide all sorts of extra opportunities for them to learn and study. And again, that will be either provincially decided or even individually school decided how they're going to actually do that. Mm. So, so they you would... think the lower grades should finish the year, finish the essential year um, in time. Okay. And then in terms of the exams, a, a matric exams still on track for the exact same time. There's a, a few anxious matriculants that are, are writing in here. They want to know, will, are the exam, will the exam timetable uh, follow the, the same timetable it's followed previous years, or do you think it'll be pushed back a bit later into the year? You know, so far I think it's it's fixed, but who knows? It might be pushed back. Okay. It might be pushed back. That's mm. um, not clear yet. And then a uh, question here from uh, Leanne Tabor around mask wearing. Obviously, you know, we've said masks are able to become part of everyday life, certainly for the next 18 to 24 months, however long the virus is with us. So mask wearing will then be compulsory in schools as well? Mask wearing will be compulsory for everybody, teachers and learners. Um, it's hard to wear a mask for five hours at a time. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that teachers will give, um, give the children, you know, time to sort of take off their mask, breathe, mm -hmm. 
run around the, the block or something and come <laughs> back home yeah. Yeah. Um, because you can't necessarily keep that on all mm. the time. So we, I, I think teachers mm. should be mm. working out some way in which a, a, a pupil can get relief from wearing the mask for a few minutes and then put it back on. Mm. And then that brings me to the next question here from Krizan around school sport. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, group activities are, are being prohibited now. Uh, gyms are being closed, big sports events being closed. Is there going to be an impact on school sport, do you think? Well, the minister has already said no school sports. Mm -hmm. Off all lockdown. No school sports at all. So mm -hmm. there will be the school day and then that will be the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And no other extramurals either from what I can work out. Okay. Well, that's quite significant. Yeah. I mean, it is particularly, it's, yes. it's, it's quite significant, but I suppose necessary in these in these hard lockdown times. Um, yes, scholar scholar so. transport. Uh, has there been any talk uh, in the department uh, or in the mix around how you know, scholar transport is going to work, getting large numbers of pupils to schools? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the principle that we follow in the DA is um, that the child should be protected from the moment they leave their home to the moment they get back home. So what happens in, and in fact, you need to also rope in the parents of that child to help with that. So the child needs to leave home and not get onto the scholar transport unless it is carrying below the minimum number of people, the, the correct number of people. There is a sanitization of your hands. There are masks. And, um, and and so forth, and then um, and then that's already being looked at uh, by the ministry and by us in the Western Cape. There are different kinds of scholar transport. The scholar transport that comes under the government is relatively straightforward to manage because you give them that instruction. The private transport, again, provinces are usually well in touch with those who do the private transport uh, in taxis and stuff. Mm -hmm. and they can also manage that through the taxi mm -hmm. associations. Yeah. So that's the plan, um, and we, we're going to be monitoring how it, how it turns mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Can so, I, I mean, I just talk a bit about our yeah, monitoring? Yes, I, wanted, I was about to get on to that. So w what role are, are the DA as public representatives going to be playing in this process? Yeah, now, so as so often, often happens with this government, they put forward a good idea, and then they don't implement it properly. Mm. So we support the idea of sending children back, back to school. Um, and we support much of what Minister Mucheka said about how it should be in phases and how it should be accompanied by hygiene and all of the various components. What we worry about is the implementation. So we've set up a, a task team of all of our provincial MPLs and our one MEC um, to oversee the actual implementation of this. And um, they are going to be looking um, next week, on the 25th, when teachers are meant to go back, they're going to have a look at that in, in, in a sample of schools. Have the teachers gone back? If they haven't, where and what the problems are? And they're going to then be looking again at the on the 1st of June when the learners go back, or some of them, and they're going to be looking at again have the learners gone back? Are all the proper provisions in place? And if not, we will alert people and we will suggest that that school be closed down again until all the proper pro protocols are in place. And we will carry on doing that for the next few months because this is a long-term project mm -hmm. as the different years start and, and come back in. Um, so we're going to be looking at it over that long time and trying to make sure that it's implemented um, as well as it's promised. Almost, yeah. Well, thank you, Belinda, and thank you very much for making yourself available today. And I think it's been fascinating. And I'm sure we'll have you back on as it proceeds to, to give us uh, a update about how things are going and some of the key issues that may arise at the time. But do you have any closing, closing thoughts that you, you would like to share on this particular subject? Well, just that um, we, we understand the concerns of parents and we want to promise that we will be a watchdog for them to, uh, to make sure that the, the plan is implemented as promised yeah. and that it's not, it doesn't just fall as short as all the other coronavirus plans uh, that the government has, has introduced. Yeah.
Well, thank you, Belinda, for your time today and uh, certainly some great feedback from our, our viewers at home. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Now I'm going to cross over to you, Elzan. And I mean, you're also a mother of children. I'm a, a father of children. Obviously, lots to think about as we as we proceed over the next few uh, weeks and months and as we adapt to this new uh, COVID world. But that's not what you had to talk about today. You're here to talk to us about our court cases. Yes. And a lot of viewers very, very interested to know uh, about our legal challenges. Why are we doing it? Why is it important? So let's start. How many legal challenges and uh, why are these important? Well, thank you, John, for having me. Mm -hmm. um, we have currently running four big court cases. Um, just to summarize them, the first one is the, I call it the BBEEE -E -E case. Mm. And that is um, set down for the 1st of June. And it's about the um, using race and different classes like gender, um, youth disability as a criteria for accessing funding. Mm. So it's mainly um, aimed at the business, small business fund and the resilience fund and the, the mm. debt finance schemes. And, uh, and it's important for us because disaster, the Disaster Management Act does not permit government to use those bases to decide who gets relief or not. Mm -hmm. Disaster um, criteria in terms of the act is one of need. And I think each and every South African and every small business mm -hmm. needs at this point. Yeah. Um, so as you know, um, uh, disaster knows no case. Mm. So, and so, I mean, also, it's also quite silly, actually, because in the case of small business, 90 odd percent of small businesses uh, are not required by their turnover to be triple B, double E um, compliant. So you could actually miss the very people you're hoping to assist by putting in place something arbitrary as triple B, double E requirements, for correct. instance. Correct. And the difference with our mm. case versus the previous cases that mm. has been um, lost uh, recently it's because we don't, in our case, it's about race mm. and the other categories. BE is not relevant here. Mm. So we firmly believe that our case will definitely um, mm. be treated differently. And we've also um, think that we want to ask the court, for, we have received mm. confirmation, I think, or we've asked for a full bench mm. so that we can have uh, the correct um, definitive judgment, correct. a definitive judgment. So obviously our case is a lot more broad than the, the previous case. So it focuses on all forms of discrimination, not necessarily just the racial component. Yes, but only with regards to those two funds. Oh, those two funds, yeah. And um, why are these cases important for South Africa? They're important because South Africans are entitled to have rational restrictions, not just waking up mm. in the morning and getting mm. a promulgated mm. government gazette saying, you can only exercise between those mm. hours and etc. So that's number one. And number two, the government needs to have oversight by parliament, by, and we, mm. the citizens, have put them there. So mm. they need to exercise their power with us watching them mm. and having a say in what they're doing, yeah. which is not currently happening. happening yeah. So we've got the triple B double E one, we've got the curfew, curfew, curfew change, and then the, uh, the uh, exercise. Uh, That's case the part and then of the and then we've got the uh, constitutional court uh, challenge. Let's talk a little bit about the constitutional court challenge because I know that's the big one and there's been a lot of write-ups uh, in the media about it. Uh, do you want to just take us through what are the key arguments that the, that we're making there? So we're attacking Section 27 of the Disaster Management Act for being unconstitutional because it what it allows for a very um, harsh. Um, use of legislative power by the Minister of Kochta. So um, there's no, it ma gives you a state of emergency without any oversight from Parliament. So that unfortunately we cannot have because you're actually worse off than you would mm. have been in a state of emergency. Mm. Um, so I think it's a very important case because we, we support and we've always supported what has been um, pronounced by the President, mm. but we need to have that be lawful. Mm. And, yeah. and like I said, the biggest um, issue there is parliamentary oversight. Yeah. Well, I was having this discussion the other day with somebody, and essentially this, that uh, a state of emergency, you're the president or the executive are required to come back every 21 days to parliament, and there's a debate and, uh, on the extension of that. In theory, 
under the Disaster Management Act, we could be kept in level four for four weeks, four months, four years, no without any requirement to, to have it uh, approved or have oversight of it by Parliament. Correct. And yeah. if, you, if one argues that Parliament has oversight because the ministers appear in their <coughs> portfolio committees, well, quite frankly, you, you have a situation where they um, give you reasons for a certain regulation, and if you don't agree, then that's just toughies. Mm. So with parliamentary oversight, they really do have the power to say no. Mm. That regulation is irrational and unlawful. Mm. Yeah. And I think they could have avoided all of this pain by just simply having agreed in the beginning to the, our request to have an ad hoc committee to oversee the Quite NCC right. and the work. Instead, the refusal there has led to this massive uh, gap in, in oversight. So what, what will the essence, if we're a success in the judgment, what would it essentially mean for the NCC, the National Command Council, and for the Act itself? Well, the Act we asked for, um, for the court to read in to the legislation the same provision that applies to the state of emergency. So we're not asking Parliament for the Act to be sent back to Parliament. That they must do eventually. But we're just asking for this moment, mm. just read the sense so that we can immediately mm get these regs before the uh, for Parliament for approval. Mm. And so if they, uh, that, that will go to the heart then of the power of the NCC. Mm. And this is the other body. I mean, we saw this week, um, I don't know if you saw in the Mail and Guardian, very senior policy uh, manager uh, in uh, Latuli House for the ANC uh, suggesting that what should happen is that the NCC should be kept in place, he argues, as a great way of accelerating government service delivery. Uh, this is hugely problematic because precisely for the reasons you speak about around lack of oversight. Correct. But are, are you getting the sense that there's a, a bit of an enjoyment around the newfound power and authority that government's got you with no oversight? Well, it's quite ironic that every time we launch a case, they amend their regulations. Yeah. So, in other words, so before you get to court, it's moot they've corrected mm. their madness or they have... Um, uh, uplifted certain mm -hmm. restrictions. I mean, as we said here, the Minister of Transport has um, amended his regulation with regards to public transport. So they're not limited to the curfew anymore, but limited to shift working and that you can only be uh, in a public transport later than mm -hmm. the curfew if it's associated with your time. So exactly. that's another victory. Yeah. Um, I, I will claim that. Oh, well done. There we go. So chalk one up for uh, Minda, Shapiro and Smith uh, yes. and, and for the DA. Thank you very much for that one. And that comes on the back of the uh, reversal and U-turn by government on e-commerce. Uh, the Correct. day we filed papers, the next day they had done a reversal on, yes. on e-commerce. So I think these, you know, these cases do help. Uh, do help and we've got to keep bringing them. But it's them. unfortunate, though. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Because I really do believe that if there has been some parliamentary input into these processes, and I think here particularly around the curfew, the ban on alcohol and tobacco, those ridiculous clothing regulations about you know, wearing a T-shirt for open warmth shoes. and high and open shoes, etc. You see, you're wearing clothes shoes today, so you're not going to be arrested by Minister yeah, Patel. So you're very lucky. But I think if those had gone through some form of parliamentary process, there would have been an opportunity for the elected representatives of people to turn around and say, "Hey, hang on a second, this is a little bit silly." Uh, you know, telling people, you know, what shirt to wear and how to wear it and what they can buy and what they can't buy. Uh, you know, and and it could have been amended. But the legislative arm, which is actually the lawmaking part of the of the uh, of support. the system has been completely bypassed here. Correct. Yeah. And I think it's um, for, I know it's politicians sitting in Parliament, but mm. at the end of the day we're all in this together and we all mm. need to keep, um, come out on the other side. Mm. So I don't see how everyone must just rationally pass these mm. regulations and I don't see why uh, we should second guess exactly what Parliament's there to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I must say, I've very, been very disappointed in Parliament. And I say that as the leader of the opposition in the House, uh, but also a member of Parliament for many, many years. You know, one of the big things, and you would recall, because you worked with us very closely on the Nkandla judgment and the Nkandla case, one of the findings in that Nkandla case was that Parliament had actually been derelict in its duty to hold the executive accountable. I'm seeing a parallel here. Uh, do you want to just... Uh, you're, quite, you're quite right. I mean, it's ab abdicating Parliament's duties here. Mm -hmm. So without Parliament doing anything, because it can't, because of the Disaster Management Act, 
it's not fulfilling its oversight <coughs> duties. Yeah. So Catherine Henderson writes in here, um, is this going straight to the Constitutional Court uh, or is it going to the High Court first? No, so Which we, cases are going where? Okay, so all the challenges except the Disaster Management Act is in the High Courts mm. and the Disaster Management Act challenge is in the Constitutional Court. We have applied for direct access. Mm. We really hope the court will mm. accept the case. Well, let's look at the time frames here because Renelle Kotzer writes here, why are the cases taking so long? I'm going to get bankrupt by the time the courts hear this. So obviously well, a lot of South Africans are really anxious to see the true. outcome of these cases. It's very frustrating for us <coughs> as well, but there's certain uniform rules of court that we mm. as law-abiding lawyers need to comply mm. with. And um, there's certain directives in each court and it's mm. unfortunately we need to believe mm. in the other side being given an opportunity to present their case so mm. that there's a good judgment at the end of the day. Mm. So people must just be patient. We do try and drive it, but sometimes people need... The government's also very busy. I can mm. understand that, as I am, but they uh, need to have an opportunity to ventilate. Mm. So it takes a little bit longer. Let's just talk a bit about rationality and reasonableness because I've got a question here from Harry who says here that in his opinion, national government isn't going to go easy on the Western Cape. How are you going to combat this? So there's a lot of concern that you know, there's, there's politics is going to come into it and there'll be some way that national government tries to keep the Western Cape in lockdown but you know, open up other parts of the country. But this would have to pass the test of rationality and reasonableness, surely. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. The same rules apply. Where you stay mm. in South Africa is irrelevant. Yeah. So if they, they wouldn't be able to target one province unfairly. That would be a law of, or a, a process of general application that would apply across the board. Yes, then. but, um, but they, as I say, if they do differentiate, it will have to be rational and their approach must be mm. reasonable and justified to yeah. limit our rights like that. Yeah. So, and I also know that both Premier Windy and the Mayor have said that, and I think Alan Windy's been very, very clear that you know the Western Cape is ready to go to level three and he set out very clearly the preparation that's gone into it. So um, Harry, I'll give you the assurance, uh, uh, give you the assurance, Harry, that we'll be, uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that uh, for you there. Elzon, you've been a, a legal practitioner for many, many years. You've gone a, traveled a long road with us and many of our court victories and, and the like. I want to talk a little bit about the functioning of the courts now during this time and the administration of justice because I mean, the legal profession is, is really taking a lot of strain during this time. Um, John, the legal profession is bleeding at the moment. Mm -hmm. I know of a lot of colleagues that have to close down, that are mm -hmm. selling their practices, that are retiring earlier. It's actually quite um, sad mm -hmm. because they can't issue new um, process out of the courts some courts allow th uh, certain things to be done, others not. Yeah. Some, I've just had a matter where we have a trial in, in a magistrate's court whilst you wouldn't even think of having a trial in a local magistrate's court. Mm. So it is, it's very frustrating mm. that there's no consistency. And we really, everyone just wants to earn a living, pay their employees, mm. and we are regarded as an essential service, mm. but we can do 90% of what we are asked to do for clients. Mm. So that's quite frustrating. So, I mean, courts now closed means massive backlogs. Now, we already knew our courts are, are pretty congested. Magistrates' courts, high courts, pretty congested already. Uh, what, what impact is this, is this going to have on, on people who are waiting for important matters to be heard? Tragedy. I mean, mm. the, the, a lot of, there's a difference between civil and criminal. So mm. the criminal system is still going on. But civil is absolute standstill. The only mm. things that you are permitted to do is urgence and that's three quarters of the time only associated with COVID-19 or by, um, um, children, etc. Mm. So that is not limited. I must mm. categorically state that you mm. can get help from mm. courts. Um, I'm t just talking about the general mm. things that people think is not important, but mm. it is for a lot of law firms. Oh. And conveyancing day. attorneys particularly. I know there's been a huge problem with the deeds office having been closed for so long and also again you know these are processes that affect government revenue government gets a percentage of uh, of, of the fees Absolutely. that are built up there so there's another area where governments use losing uh, a revenue stream like, as they have in the loss of the sin taxes and tobacco and alcohol absolutely the deeds office i mean it opened last week closed two days later and mm. then yesterday a, a, one of the employees was apparently a, um, 
in contact with someone that was tested positive. So now the deeds office is closed, closed again. for um, sanitizing. And one doesn't even know how long that will take. So mm. conveyances needs to plan. They need mm. to know, okay, that's how many we have, you know. And for budget purposes, for people not to retrench people, not to um, to be able to pay people's salaries or half mm. of it at least. We don't have that. We don't have any. We've got communication, but it's always a day. And I, and I accept it's unpredictable. Mm. But it would have been just... It's it's just not working. It's the point them. you talk about consistency, and I think right. that's also been the, the the case with so many of the other regulations. It's just a the inconsistency stuff doesn't make sense, and then you've got different interpretations right. of it at a level. So you've seen you know people being stopped at roadblocks. Uh, I had a case this week of a guy who had uh, four packets of cigarettes that he had bought prior to the lockdown on him uh, in his vehicle, and they got confiscated. But you know, there's, uh, and yet, you know, you've, he was treated as if he was smuggling cigarettes. Meanwhile, and he had the receipt to prove that they had been bought prior to the, the well, lockdown that's taking like place. That's our case today that was mm. before the High Court about mm. the f distribution of food. Yes, Do let's mean? talk about that. So we had the Human Rights Commission rule in our favour this week, but we're going to court today on the food yes, parcels. Yes, as I sit here now, I, yeah. hope, I don't know what happened. But okay. <laughs> uh, we have, we brought an application to we've noticed that um, the SAPS and officials from this Department of Social Development was enforcing directives from the minister that was not mm. promulgated. So it's not law. Mm. And But they've willingly closed NGOs um, providing food to, the, to mm. the vulnerable. So we went to court to get a declarator to say, SAPS, you can't enforce these. It's not um, promulgated. And get an assurance from the minister that she'll mm. issue that instruction to her own officials. We've also uh, ensured, well, we asked the court that we get prior notice to before she publishes any directions in any way similar to those mm. that she was planning or at least the mm. drafts that we've seen because it's absurd. Mm. Uh, the weak and the hungry is going to die if those mm. are implemented. Mm. It's quite shocking. So, mm. But you just wonder about why. Why would a government in the midst of a humanitarian crisis want to prohibit people feeding the poor? Something which has happened for centuries. That's true. And I'm actually disappointed that they don't think NGOs administer the regulations of sanitizing, mm. of social distancing. They do. In, in, Often better than government. You know, we've already seen our police minister Visiting Absolutely. friends uh, you know, of his and cabinet, etc. That's yes. uh, but I happen. must say they've they also take. I think they'll take our suggested um, mm. amendments into account. I hope, and that's mm. where it comes in oversight. Yeah. So. Well, it's just a pity we've got to go to court on these things. I mean, this yes. is sort of things that I'm not complaining. Had you? Yes, you're not complaining because you're a legal practitioner. But uh, you know, these things cost money, and uh, you know, they're cons Lots. time consuming, and it it's important. Lizeka from News Twenty Four wants to know whether the government's filed any answering affidavits yet on the challenge of the regulations. Which one? Well, all of them. Well, yes, all of them are opposed. Okay. All of them. And the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court. Uh, in some, we've the pleadings have closed. Mm. In others, we're still waiting for answering affidavits. Mm. Well, Lizeka says, yeah, we, we said that the president should have declared a state of emergency. That's not what... Uh, no. I've certainly never said there should be a state of emergency. We just want to be in the same position that In the same position with, with oversight. oversight. Yeah. Okay. So we want the same measures of oversight that's in the state of emergency Correct. to be reflected in the Disaster Management Act uh, for all of the... Uh, and then also, I mean, we sit, uh, saw again today a, a, an article just as I was coming into studio around keeping the ban on alcohol and cigarettes until level one by Minister and Courses on at Lamini Zuma. And it is just such a source of frustration that you know, in the midst of this pandemic, no other countries banned alcohol and tobacco, governments losing billions of rands every month, and yet this, uh, this, this remains. Do you think it's starting to reach the point where it's irrational and unreasonable? Most definitely. Yeah. And people are, the first three weeks and they're after another two weeks and then you can still handle a lot of things. Mm. But we know everyone's mm. getting frustrated. Yeah. Everyone. But also, you know, the thing that really frustrates me about this is that I don't know if the minister honestly at night sits at home thinking that she stopped people smoking and stopped people drinking. The truth of the matter is smokers are still smoking. 
They're paying a lot more for the cigarettes, but they're still smoking. Uh, instead of buying are, food. Instead of buying food. Uh, they are uh, brewing their own alcohol. They're buying alcohol. There's this huge burgeoning black market that's being built up that's going to take years to rein in again at the end of this and if this folly continues, surely. And I think there's a big market of creating um, people making unsafe alcohol. Yeah. I mean, the stories I've heard is... is Frightening. Well, you're a lawyer, so you wouldn't be brewing uh, anything uh, there in the, in the northern uh, suburbs, I, I hope. I for, I've, I've um, stocked up. <laughs> you stocked up before the, uh, yes. before the lockdown. Well, um, obviously, you know, we'll obviously have to look at this now. We're waiting now the level three regulations. We made some inputs today about what level three should look like after our engagement with the president. But it's important that we start opening up a bit more. But certainly, I think that it would be a folly for... And of course, I'm at Zuma to, to push forward for the alcohol and tobacco. It makes no sense from epidemiological level or an economic level. And government needs this money. It's not like Definitely. we've got this huge indefinite pot of money. We need those billions of rand to buy ventilators, to pay nurses and doctors, to buy ICU beds. So it just doesn't make sense no. to me from a rationality or reasonableness perspective. Well, Alzan, thank you very much for being in studio and thanks to uh, Minde Shapiro-Smith for uh, allowing you to come through and spend some time with us today. And we hope to have you back on as we start to win these cases, to come and share the good news with uh, all the Corona Cast viewers. Please, hopefully yeah. it's just a matter of time. <laughs> good stuff. Well, folks, that's all we've got time for this week. I hope you found it interesting. It was certainly great to have both Belinda and Alzan uh, with us here today uh, on the Corona Cast, and I hope you found it uh, found it worthwhile. Please remember to keep your uh, questions coming in uh, on the on the lines, and make sure that you also visit our website www.da.org.za forward slash defeating coronavirus to keep you up to date with exactly what's going on. We submitted our level three proposals this afternoon on deadline and we hope they're going to find some fertile ground with government. My shout out for uh, this episode goes to all of those NGOs and CBOs uh, and church-based organizations who are out there every day feeding hungry South Africans. Thank you for your commitment uh, to being your brother's keeper uh, in these times of trouble for South Africa and in these very, very depressed economic times. Uh, we've all got to look out for each other uh, to get through this virus. And we are going to get through it, South Africa. Uh, we've got to stay positive and we've got to stay uh, united and we've got to keep pushing forward uh, to, till we defeat uh, the COVID virus in South Africa. I'll see you again on Tuesday, uh, same time, same place, uh, two o'clock. And uh, until then, keep safe, South Africa.